California has 11. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that, I yield three minutes to the gentlelady from Massachusetts, uh, Ms. Songus, who's the ranking member on the Oversight and Investigation Committee and also has done uh, fabulous work on the uh, sexual assault legislation contained in this bill. The gentlelady from Massachusetts recognized for three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this year's NDAA takes unprecedented steps to address the disturbing prevalence of sexual assault in the military. And I want to thank Chairman McKeon, Ranking Member Smith, Congressman Wilson, and Congresswoman Davis for including these provisions in the bill. I'd also like to thank my co-chair of the Military Sexual Assault Prevention Con uh, Caucus, Congressman Mike Turner. In recent months, we have seen reports rise military commanders and supervisors abuse their authority, and officers in charge of sexual assault prevention efforts allegedly commit the crimes they were sworn to stop. This is a systemic problem, and the NDAA takes real consequential actions in response. This NDAA begins to reform the power of a military commander, the first major bipartisan effort in decades to make such a significant change on the command structure. Commanders will no longer have the authority to dismiss court-martial convictions for serious offenses, including sexual assault, and are prohibited from reducing guilty findings for serious offenses. And make sure that those who are convicted of sexual assault will, at a minimum, be dishonorably discharged or dismissed. And this bill continues our push to provide victims of sexual assault with access to legal counsel, which is a critical step in the process of creating an environment that encourages victims to report these crimes and in bringing those responsible to justice. These and others are significant reforms that offer considerable momentum toward changing the deeply rooted and flawed culture that has allowed these crimes to pervade our armed forces. We are making progress, but there is a long way to go. Last year's bill established a nine-member independent review panel to evaluate the systems used to investigate, prosecute, and adjudicate sexual assault crimes under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. The members of this panel are just getting to work now, and their input one year from now will be invaluable in making sure that Congress continues its work to make the best reforms possible and end the scourge of sexual assault. I look forward to continuing to work with the many members in both chambers, the victims who have bravely come forward, and the committed military leaders who are all meaningfully contributing to this debate to make sure that this issue can never again be disregarded or ignored. I also want to take a moment to highlight the important work that this bill advances to develop superior lightweight body armor for our service members. While the ceramic plates which our service members insert into their tactical vests have always provided the requisite level of protection in Iraq and Afghanistan, they are unfortunately still too heavy and are causing an epidemic of musculoskeletal injuries among service members, which the VA will be paying for over decades to come. Last year, the NDAA contained language requiring the continued development of body armor systems for female service members, as the legacy systems fit poorly. This I yield the gentlelady an additional 30 seconds. The gentlelady will be yielded an additional 30 seconds. And that lightweight, that body armor that hadn't been designed for female members put female soldiers at greater risk in the field. This year's bill requires the Secretary of Defense to submit a comprehensive R&D strategy for lightweight body armor to Congress. I believe this is an important step, and I thank Airland Subcommittee Chair Turner and Ranking Member Sanchez for their work on this matter. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Washington Reserves. The gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I yield three minutes to my friend and colleague, the Chairman of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, the Gentlelady from Alabama, Ms. Roby. The Gentlelady from Alabama is recognized for three minutes. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to rise in support of H.R. 1960, and I'd like to thank uh, my chairman and the ranking member, uh, all the subcommittee chairman and ranking members for all of the hard work that has gone into uh, this bill. This is a strong bipartisan bill that properly funds our military. It provides for our men and women in uniform and their families while ensuring that our warfighters have the necessary equipment and provisions to continue to ensure our nation's security. I'm honored to chair the 
the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee uh, of the House Armed Services Committee. I am pleased to have as my colleague and ranking member, Ms. Songus of Massachusetts. The world has changed tremendously in the past decade. It remains a dangerous place, but in new and challenging ways. And for this reason, H.R. 1960 takes into account the threats this nation faces today and the forces that we must maintain in response. The members of the House Armed Services Committee are united in the belief that we must not return to the days of a hollow military decried by General Edward Shymeyer 33 years ago. Indeed, H.R. 1960 addresses part of our military's current readiness crisis. It restores funding so planes can take flight, ships can sail, and our military can train at the pace and scope which is necessary. This bill responsibly responds to the global conditions, but does so within this nation's fiscal constraints. H.R. 1960 also ensures that as Afghan forces assume an incredibly large role in Afghanistan's defense, preserving the safety and security of Afghan women will be among our priorities. It includes important provisions so that the Department of Defense understands the lessons of Benghazi and organizes forces to preclude or better respond to a similar attack. This year's National Defense Authorization Act maintains that the detention facility in Guantanamo Bay is being funded, operated, and managed properly, and it also provides the necessary guidance relating to Iran, North Korea, and Syria. I am proud to represent two distinguished military installations, uh, Maxwell Air Force Base and Fort Rucker, and I'm mindful of the important roles these and all other installations around the world play in ensuing the defense, uh, ensuring the defense of this great nation. In light of the strong provisions included in H.R. 1960 uh, and the collaborative bipartisan sentiments upon which it rests, I join my colleagues in urging support for the National Defense Authorization Act. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California reserves. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield uh, three minutes to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Andrews. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for three minutes. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank my friend for yielding. I'd like to thank and congratulate him and Chairman McKeon and their outstanding staffs for first-rate work and leadership on this issue. Uh, this bill is an example of a properly resourced and properly thought-out plan that would serve the interests of those who serve us. As we meet tonight, there are America's best sons and daughters stationed around the world in dangerous and often lonely places who are defending our freedom and doing us proud every single day. I do believe this budget plan is one that gives them the tools and the support that they need, and it has many good things to recommend it. But I wish it were actually going to take effect, because the fact of the matter is, unless this Congress acts, this plan will never take effect. Instead, it will be about $50 billion shy of the resources that we're going to debate and vote on this week. Mr. Speaker, I think the whole House would be well served by following the example by which this legislation was put together. Led by Chairman McKeon and Mr. Smith, there was open, transparent, substantive dialogue throughout this process. Members on both sides of the aisles met for my goodness, was it 16 hours, 18 hours? It seemed like longer. And any idea that any member had was brought to the body, was vigorously debated, and either approved or disapproved. And there was an open process that led to a good piece of legislation. This is exactly the opposite of what we've done in the sequestration problem. There have been backroom meetings. There have been you know, high-level discussions, and absolutely nothing has happened. This, frankly, is a bipartisan responsibility and a national problem. I think that what we, is incumbent upon us doing here is that the budget that has passed this chamber and the budget that has passed the other body should be brought to a conference. And our body should select our conferees, and I'm sure the other body will select its, and they will thrash out this process, and I hope come to a resolution of this mindless, harmful sequestration process. About a third of our Navy and Air Force planes aren't flying training missions because of sequestration. 
There's intelligence training for intelligence units throughout the services not being done because of sequestration. Important research and development, deferred maintenance on our capital stock isn't being done because of this problem. We have spent hours in this chamber accusing each other of whose fault it is that we're in this box. I frankly think the American people are tired of hearing whose fault it is and are ready to see this problem resolved. The way to resolve this problem is to do what the leaders, I would ask for 30 more seconds. Gentleman is recognized for an additional 30 seconds. I thank my friend. The way to solve this problem is to emulate the example that Chairman McKeon and Mr. Smith has given us. Have a fair, transparent, open process. Debate the issues. Make some difficult choices. There are other difficult choices yet to make because the amendments that are forthcoming. When the members are given the chance to act in regular order, we can solve problems. Let's have that full and open debate on sequestration and someday the plan we're going to pass this week will actually take effect. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Washington Reserves, the gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I yield two minutes to my friend and colleague, a member of the Armed Services Committee, the General Lady from South Dakota, Ms. Nome. The General Lady from South Dakota is recognized for two minutes. Thank you. And I thank the Chairman for leading and for all of his hard work on this very important bill that we have on the floor today. Mr. Speaker, the number is staggering. 26,000. That's how many military members were sexually assaulted last year alone. And thousands more were unwilling to come forward. Since 2010, there has been a 35% increase in military sexual assaults. This is a disturbing trend that needs to be stopped, and I would like to thank the Chairman for working with me and for many other members on the committee to do just exactly that. There's no doubt that our military is the strongest, the most capable force in the world. The men and women who voluntarily step up to serve and to defend this country know full well that they will be called potentially to serve in times of danger, but they should never, under any circumstances, feel threatened in one another's presence. For many, the military is an extension of family, and nothing hurts more than being hurt or let down by one of your own. You know, last week the House Armed Services Committee passed the 2014 National Defense Authorization Act by an overwhelming vote of 59 to 2. I was proud to support the bill in committee. It takes important steps to address the rise of sexual assault in our military, including several provisions that I authored. These provisions will improve military sexual assault investigations. They will also standardize sexual assault prevention training programs and require the Pentagon to increase scrutiny of those selected that will fill sexual assault prevention positions in the military. Necessary reforms that need to get done. For years, lawmakers, military officials, and civilians alike have discussed the need to bring an end to sexual assault. I see a real opportunity with this bill to put those words into action, to take meaningful steps to address this growing problem. It's time to say once and for all that sexual assault ends now. In order to do that, we need to ensure that there are adequate protections in place that encourage the reporting of sexual assaults without fear of reprisal or further abuse from peers. We must provide support for victims and insist on swift punishment for those responsible. I'm done. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I yield back. <laughs> she is that. Okay, the lady <laughs> yields back. The gentleman from California Reserves, the gentleman from Washington is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield three minutes. The gentleman uh, from Connecticut, uh, Mr. Courtney. The gentleman from Connecticut is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the National Defense Authorization Act of 2014. And again, I want to congratulate the chairman and the ranking member and the committee staff for a, a process that was um, really a breath of fresh air in this Congress. A long meeting, uh, lots of hot debates and passionate debates, many opportunities, frankly, for the polarization that seems to dominate this Congress to, to break down the process. But at the end of the day, we had a strong vote, 59 to 2, uh, obviously very bipartisan. And we came together uh, as, as a committee to make sure that core functions of the government, our national defense, uh, are in fact going to be advanced. In particular, I want to focus for a moment on the bipartisan effort made in the Sea Power and Projection Force Subcommittee to support our nation's shipbuilding priorities. This bill supports the President's budget request for continued production of two Virginia-class submarines in 2014, building on our efforts last year to restore a boat that had been removed from the shipbuilding plan. Uh, this measure also uh, continues investment in critical undersea capabilities such as the replacement of our SSBN fleet and the Virginia payload module. In particular, and also, the bill supports construction of eight battle 
four ships, four littoral combat ships, a DDG-51 destroyer, as well as continued work on a new aircraft carrier and vital sea power programs. To put that in context, the build rate in 2006 was only four Battle Force ships. In 2008, it was only three uh, Battle Force ships. Uh, as we have heard firsthand in our subcommittee, a stable, predictable, and robust shipbuilding plan is the best way to ensure that our taxpayers are getting cost-effective ships with the block grant fixed price model that is producing ships ahead of schedule and below price. I know this is an issue that our panel will continue to look at closely as we move forward. In 2011, in Libya, we saw firsthand the value of a strong naval force where Operation Odyssey Dawn used sea power to wipe out the air defense system of Muammar Gaddafi, again, using surface ships and submarines, firing Tomahawk missiles. In a matter of hours, we had advanced the cause for our NATO allies to uh, finish up the, the work. So this is, again, critical to the refocus of our naval and strategic plan in Asia, Pacific, and the Middle East. Again, we need a strong shipbuilding plan and naval force uh, 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 structure, which this bill will provide strong resources, again, far greater than in past years. So again, I want to close by saluting the chairman's tremendous work and, his, and our staff in terms of making sure that both sides of the aisle came together to uh, protect core functions of our government, which again, the Sea Power uh, Subcommittee in particular will uh, advance. And with that, I would yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Washington reserves. The gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I yield two and a half minutes to my friend and colleague, a member of the Armed Services Committee, the gentlelady from Indiana, Ms. Wilorski. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized for two and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee for yielding me time. I also want to thank him for his tremendous leadership and, and uh, Mr. Smith as well in crafting a bill that brings solutions to combat sexual violence in the armed forces. This bill includes a provision that I authored with Congresswoman Loretta Sanchez to encourage victims to step out of the darkness. The provision specifically identifies reports of sexual assault as a form of communication under whistleblower protections. It ensures that victims cannot face reprisal for reporting acts of sexual assault. Sexual violence has reached ep epidemic proportions and is eroding the foundations of trust that our military traditions have been built upon. I had the privilege to visit our troops in Afghanistan and stand shoulder to shoulder with the finest military in the world. Hearing their concerns on this issue firsthand typifies the horrific reality of this situation. Mr. Speaker, there were an estimated 26,000 cases of military sexual assault last year alone, with only 3,600 victims reporting. It's reported that 62% of those who have been assaulted went on to experience some form of retaliation. Citing these facts and figures does not attest to the victims and the real-life faces of this problem. We're talking about our sons and daughters. We are talking about our brothers and sisters. In Indiana, a brave woman named Lisa Wilkin, an Air Force veteran, came forward to share her own story of repetitive sexual abuse that she suffered during her military career. After being raped, she reported the incident to the Air Force. Her description of the reporting process was chilling. Whistleblower protections like what I'm talking about today will create an environment for safe reporting so that victims like Lisa can come forward and demand justice. For the troops who have been victimized while serving their country and the countless Americans who someday want to serve in this great military, I ask that we do the right thing. It's time for this Congress to do the right thing, and it's time for this Congress to act. I ask my colleagues to join me in supporting this bill and the thoughtful reforms contained within. Thank you, and I, reserve, I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California reserves. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield myself the balance of our time. The gentleman um, is recognized. I just again want to emphasize how important this piece of legislation is um, and the work that goes into it and the, all the members that have said, you know, this is the way legislation is supposed to work. Um, it really does work when you do the legislative process, when you have committee hearings and you debate amendments and you put together a product. And also to remind folks how important this piece of legislation is. It, it funds and supports our military uh, in providing for the national security of this country. It is critically important uh, that we pass it and get it done. I do also, however, want to emphasize the point that uh, Mr. Andrews made, and that is that unfortunately, unless we do something about sequestration, um, this bill is going to be largely undone. Um, taking $50 billion out of this budget um, in a meat axe fashion will, will not 
be helpful. So we have to do something about sequestration if we're going to be able to protect this process. So I would urge the full body to, to follow the example of the Armed Services Committee, get together, work out a bipartisan solution to make sure uh, that we can protect this work and not, not just the national security. Sequestration obviously affects all parts of government um, in a very, very negative way. Infrastructure, education, health care, all jeopardized by the sequestration legislation. So I would urge us to deal with that, but in the meantime, I thank the chairman um, and I thank all the members and the staff for uh, the great work that they've done in putting together this bill, and I urge support. The gentleman, I yield back. the gentleman from Washington yields the back his time. The gentleman from California is recognized. Uh, might I require how much time we have remaining? The gentleman has four and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield myself the balance of the time. The gentleman is recognized. At this time, I'd like to thank Mr. Smith. Uh, this is our third bill that we've worked on in, in this, these positions, and, and uh, I think we've become better friends over the years. We, we understand each other. We know that we, at times, will have disagreements. I have to confess, uh, I've been married now 50 years, and my wife and I have had a couple of disagreements. I was always wrong, and uh, uh, she's stood by me, and uh, we've had a great uh, relationship, and we have a great relationship working in this committee. Likewise, our staff. I think they have done yeoman's work to get us to this point, and our subcommittee chairman and ranking members that we've heard uh, speak here today. And I have to agree with, uh, with, with Mr. Smith uh, on the sequestration. We, uh, I think, all understand that this is bad for our nation. We uh, voted on it, those of us who did, uh, knowing that, uh, understanding that it would be, uh, that it would never happen. Well, reality set in and it happened. And you know, I've had a few people come to me and say, gee, sequestration isn't that bad. They really haven't seen the full impact to this point. We're just starting into the first year of uh, sequestration. And, and I was meeting with uh, General Breedlove today, our new European commander. And he's just a month into his, uh, into his new job, and he's starting to feel the sequestration. And I think what we need to understand is, and I've talked to each of our military leaders as they came in, and secretaries, as they came before our committee for uh, the hearings that led up to this bill, that if something doesn't happen between now and September 30th, all of this work, everything that we're working on, is, is as Mr. Smith has pointed out, going away. We are cutting $487 billion out of defense over the next 10 years. That's in the bill. We also, through sequestration, cut another $500 billion out of defense over the next 10 years. That is not reflected in the, this year's portion is not reflected in this bill. Our budget committee in the House passed a budget and they kept the top line number uh, from the Budget Control Act of $967 billion and they gave us additional money for defense which we've used in this bill. But if we're not able to resolve the differences between us and the Senate on September 30th, it will be like uh, Cinderella in that magic shoe. Uh, everything goes away. The uh, carriage becomes a cantaloupe and, or a pumpkin, and, uh, and it's bad times. And, and we've got to deal with that. We've got to deal with uh, raising the, the debt limit. And there are a lot of very serious things on the, on the table. So I would encourage all of our colleagues to join in the debate tomorrow. We had a great debate in committee. We had differences. We talked about them. We didn't get personal. We didn't get rancorous. We came out with a vote of 59 to 2 because everybody on this committee understands how important our work is, how important our national defense is, how important the men and the women and their families uh, in uniform are, and we stand behind them. Now, we, we do need to make sure that we have the resources that they need. 
With that, Mr. Chairman, I would encourage all of us to support this bill tomorrow, join in the process, make it a better bill if we can, and with that, I would yield back the balance of my time. With that, the gentleman yields back. All time for general debate has expired. Pursuant to the rule, the committee rises. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Speaker, the Committee of the Whole House of the, on the State of the Union, having a hat under consideration, H.R. 1960, directs me to report that it has come to no resolution thereon. The Chair of the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union reports that the Committee has had under consideration H.R. 1960 and has come to no resolution thereon. The chair will entertain requests for one minute speech. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, my friends on the other side of the aisle like to refer to the House majority as the party of no. And you know what? I'm okay with that. We said no to unending and out of control spending and passed a budget that balances in 10 years. We said no to the largest tax increase in history and repealed Obamacare. We said no to fraud and political games and demanded answers from the Internal Revenue Service. We said no to the fact that, our, that four Americans in Benghazi are dead and we will not rest until we have answers. We have said no to the tax more, spend more, save less, big government, job-killing machine that is crushing the American spirit and our economic growth. We have replaced government growth and regulations with reform. We have restored transparency and trust. We're giving our nation a reason to believe that one day our children won't be looking for a job, they'll be creating jobs. America was founded by patriots who said no to the tyrannical government that was crushing their freedom and economic future. And America's future rests in the hands of those who will carry on the torch of freedom to protect the future of their children and grandchildren. America's future rests in the hands of those who are sometimes willing to say no. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Gentlemen from New York, for what purpose do you rise? Without objection, the gentleman has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. State governments, institutions, businesses, and private individuals are organizing to meet the challenges and opportunities of climate change. For example, experts from New York State's land-grant college, Cornell University, have partnered with others at McGill University in Montreal and the private sector to define the needs of the region's agricultural sector in a warmer climate. Farmers still will need new plant varieties. The longer growing season will open possibilities for growing new crops. The timing of planting and fertilizing will change. Pest management will indeed be different. Climate change uh, can be approached uh, with a positive perspective for agriculture, but only if we plan now to take advantage of new opportunities and prepare for the transition. So where are we as a body on this issue? We should be uh, talking climate change and taking it into account as we move a new five-year farm bill forward. We should be taking action to adapt our infrastructure and economy to these changes. But there is no discussion or action on this crucial issue. Change is underway. We have little time to lose. We can meet this challenge, slow down the rate of change, Gentlemen. adapt to the new conditions, and take advantage of new opportunities, but only if we begin today. Gentlemen's time, time has expired. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Are there any more requests for one minute? Seeing none, under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3, 2013, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lee, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the minority leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. First of all, uh, let me just say I'm uh, truly honored tonight to anchor this special order on the Farm Bill uh, on behalf of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. And I just want to thank uh, our co-chairs, Congressman Keith Ellison and Congressman Roe Grehalver for their uh, tremendous leadership and for giving us the opportunity to really speak to the American people once a week about what is truly taking place here in Washington, D.C. As uh, the co-chair of the Out of Poverty Caucus, which we founded actually during the Bush administration, and now uh, chair of the new Democratic Whip Task Force on Poverty and Opportunity, let me just highlight how truly important it is to continue to support programs that lift Americans out of poverty. 
even as our economy slowly recovers income inequality continues to grow unfortunately too many people who are working are poor and they're living on the edge i want to take a moment now and just yield a few minutes to my colleague the co chair of the progressive caucus and i will return and complete what i have to say but i know he has to to leave and i'd like for him to be able to um, engage in this discussion at this point well mr speaker i just want to thank the gentle lady from california barbara lee who has been leading this country for years uh, on the question of economic justice, civil rights, human rights. This issue of uh, supplemental nutrition uh, assistance program, also known as food stamps, is critical. We have a farm bill that contemplates a uh, $20 billion cut in the food stamp program. And uh, I think it's just important that Americans know just a few basic things about the food stamp program. One is that uh, many people on food stamps have jobs and work every day. Uh, these folks work hard. They work in jobs that pay so little that they don't have enough money to, to, uh, to, to make it uh, without some assistance. But these are the people who uh, probably are making sure that the office buildings we go into are clean and sanitary. These are the folks who prepare fast food. These people uh, are the folks who make sure that uh, that, that we have uh, sometimes we're safe because some of the security guards making very low wages. In fact, in 2010, 41 percent of SNAP recipients lived in a household with earnings. That means 41 percent were earning some income, and, but they still didn't earn enough money to make a go of it. So this idea that uh, food stamps promote dependency is wrong. In fact, what food stamps do is provide enough food for families uh, to make it, uh, nearly half of whom are working a job. Uh, it's also important to bear in mind, too, that 76% um, of, uh, of, of SNAP households include a child, a senior citizen, or a disabled person. And about 45% of SNAP recipients are, in fact, children. The reality is, is that uh, if you have a problem with SNAP, then, you know, we're not, we're talking about children, seniors, disabled people, uh, three quarters of whom are, the, uh, are those households that receive SNAP. Now, it is also true that there are some single adults who get SNAP. And I had the chance to meet one on Monday. And this young fellow was 19 years old, and he had been looking for work, uh, going from place to place, and he uh, hadn't eaten in a few, uh, a few days and actually got so dizzy that uh, he fell. His friends picked him up, got him some supplemental food quickly, and then he somehow got into the SNAP program. But when I looked in the eyes of this young fellow, I didn't see somebody who didn't want to work. I saw a hardworking Minnesotan who wanted to make a contribution, but who had t tough times and was down on his luck for a little while. He wanted to work, he's still looking for a job, but the food stamps got him in a position where he could look for the job. And, you know, I just want to share with you, Mr. Speaker and, 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 um, and Congresswoman Lee, you know, on Monday, uh, my good friend uh, Betty, Betty McCullum and I were um, at the state legislature in St. Paul, Minnesota. Betty represents St. Paul, I represent uh, Minneapolis. And we came together and uh, we listened to some people who really know the, 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 first, uh, the first hand experience. We talked to people from the faith community. Patricia Law of St. Paul uh, Church of Christ. Uh, we talked to uh, Marie Ellis of Catholic Charities and Judith Tenenbaum of Maison. And all three of them talked about how if we cut SNAP uh, to the tune that is proposed in the Farm Bill, the, the charities that they run are already stretched to the limit. And therefore, it would be very difficult for them to try to pick up the slack that the government would drop if, they, if the government quit. Um, Patricia Lull of the St. Paul Council of Churches, I said Church of Christ, I made a mistake. It was uh, Council of Churches has a slogan, No More Hungry Neighbors. She talked about 18,200 people seeking assistance from food shelves in Minnesota every day. And um, 
which was pretty upsetting. And uh, another thing that I'd like to share with the speaker, too, is that there was a woman who spoke from Hennepin County. She's a health administrator, and her name is Jennifer uh, Kubilis, and she talked about the negative health effects of reduced nutrition access caused by SNAP cuts. So as, she, as she's, she's trying to describe how so many people who end up in the ER or, or have medical problems, their underlying problem is that they're food insecure or housing insecure. She talked about a woman who uh, was not taking her meds. And, and, and when they, they said, well, well do you, would, why don't you take the meds? She said, well, they hurt my stomach. Well, why do the meds hurt your stomach? Well, have you eaten? Well, no, I don't have any money for food. So she's supposed to be eating this food, eating regularly, and she's not, and so she's not taking the meds because they, they hurt her stomach. Getting food literally helped her take her medication. And I just, I just thought to myself, look, you know, what are we doing? You know, richest country in the history of the world can't take care of some people who are happy to have some tough times. Bottom line is, most people on SNAP don't use the program forever. Some do use it for a long time, but many only use it for about a year when they need it. Um, and uh, many, as I said, 41% are, are working. And I personally don't mind as an American taxpayer helping seniors, children, and people with disabilities have a good, healthy, nutritious meal. So I uh, have to abandon my friends now. I'm sorry to have to do that. But I am so proud that we're here tonight saying that there's not, there's, there's, it's not weakness. You're not some kind of a sucker if you have compassion for your fellow Americans who don't have enough food. You're not, you're not throwing away money. You're doing something that is absolutely necessary in any compassionate society would have a way to help people who cannot eat. And it's simply not the case that our churches, our synagogues, our mosques, and our other charities can pick up the slap if uh, the government drops out of uh, helping people uh, who, who are food insecure. So I'm going to then uh, thank my good friend from California uh, and uh, just uh, thank you for carrying on this great tradition and, and, and we're going to stay there for the folks on SNAP tonight. I want to thank our co-chair of the Progressive Caucus, Congressman Ellison, for once again his tremendous leadership, but also for that very powerful and very graphic uh, statement, sharing the stories of, of people who are struggling just to survive. And so that's what this is really about. The majority of people on SNAP do not want to be on SNAP. They want to work. They want to take care of their families, and they want to live the American dream. Let me yield now to the gentlelady from Connecticut, Congresswoman DeLauro, member of the Appropriations Committee, Subcommittee on Ag, and I don't know of anyone who has fought the good fight on behalf of the poor, low-income individuals, middle-income individuals, the most vulnerable, our seniors, than Congresswoman DeLauro. And so I just want to thank the gentlelady for really staying true to the cause and for being here tonight with us. Thank you so much and it's, a, it's an honor to join with you uh, and I know where your, your heart, your head um, and your courage lie with regard uh, to this issue and we applaud you for your efforts uh, with regard uh, to, the, uh, to the one caucus around this place who says that our goal and our mission is to make sure uh, that uh, uh, people who are poor today, uh, let us help them move out of that being poor. Let, th let us help them move into the middle class because, in fact, they do want to work. They do want to take care of their families. They're not just statistics, and they are people to be upheld and respected and not to be vilified in so many ways as they are today. So I congratulate you and your efforts. I'm proud to be here with you tonight and with my colleague, Congressman uh, uh, Ellison and the Progressive Caucus for his comments and remarks. And I see that we are also joined by our colleague, uh, Mr. Johnson, and thank you for your efforts uh, as well. And as you're talking about the high, what tonight is all about is highlighting severe immoral cuts that are made to anti-hunger and nutrition programs, particularly 
the food stamp program and that is coming from the house of representatives in the farm bill that it passed out of committee everyone knows millions of families are struggling in this economy across this country nearly fifteen percent of american households were food insecure in two thousand ten nearly fifty million americans over sixteen million children are struggling with hunger right now it is about children it is about the disabled it is about seniors and this is a problem all across this land my state of connecticut in my district connecticut statistically is the richest state in the nation because we have fairfield county and some parts of the state that's known as the gold coast with very affluent people but we have such pockets of hunger that in my district one out of seven are food insecure and I'm tired of the commentary on food insecurity what that means and my colleague knows this we've talked about this it is about being hungry these folks one out of seven don't know where their next meal is coming from and in Mississippi 24.5 percent suffer food hardship nearly one in four people West Virginia and Kentucky that job drops to just over 22 percent one in five in Ohio nearly 20 percent California just over 19 percent the estimates of Americans at risk of going hungry here in this land of plenty are appalling and at times such as this our key federal food security programs become all the more important this is especially true of food stamps, our country's most important effort to deal with hunger here at home and to ensure that American families can put food on the table for their kids. Right now, food stamps are helping over 47 million Americans, nearly half of them children, to meet their basic food needs. They make a tremendous difference for the health and the well-being of families, as our colleague Mr. Ellison pointed out with his examples. Food stamps have been proven to improve low-income children's health, their development, reduce food insecurity, and have a continuing positive influence into adulthood. And you know, I've always listened to people that talk about waste, fraud, abuse. Food stamps also has one of the lowest error rates of any government program. Go to the IRS, go to defense, Go to a crop insurance program and you'll find waste, fraud, and abuse. The food stamps are good for the economy. Economists agree that food stamps have a powerful, positive impact on economic growth. Last month, Bloomberg ran an article called, and I quote, Best Stimulus Package May Be Food Stamps because they get resources into the hands of families who are going to spend those dollars right away. And you know what, most importantly, food stamps are the right thing to do. 99% of food stamp recipients have incomes below the poverty line. And it is the job of good government to help vulnerable families get back on their feet. And in the words of Harry Truman, and I quote, nothing is more important in our national life than the welfare of our children and the proper nourishment comes first in attaining this welfare. You know, this is something that everyone in Washington used to agree on. In the past, there's been a strong tradition of bipartisanship on hunger and nutrition. From the left, leaders like George McGovern. From the right, leaders like Bob Dole. They came together. They made a difference for families who were in need. And over the past 30 years, of policies that are aimed at debt and deficit reduction, the key programs that help the most vulnerable among us to get by have always been protected on a bipartisan basis by deep cuts. But the Farm Bill coming out of the House right now seeks to destroy that tradition. And in the name of deficit reduction, the bill slashes food stamps by more than $20 billion, hurting millions of Americans and our economy. They eliminate categorical eligibility. Their bill would force up to 2 million low-income Americans to go hungry. Their bill kicks 210,000 low-income children from the free school lunch program. It changes the relationship between SNAP and LIHEAP to take benefits from more low-income Americans and mostly seniors and working families with kids. Let's be clear, this has nothing to do 
with deficit reduction and everything to do with the ideological priorities of a House majority. And ever since the Speaker took the gavel, this majority has tried to slash through the most crucial threads of our American social safety net. The Ryan budget cut over $130 billion from food stamps, mostly by converting it to an inadequate block grant. Last year, when the House Ag Committee had to identify $33 billion in 10-year savings from the programs of their jurisdiction, they singled out food stamps for all of the cuts. Not direct payments, not crop insurance, just food stamps for the entire cut. It's a terrible policy. It will cause hunger and more health problems. The cuts are lopsided. It's a dereliction of our responsibility to the American people and of our moral responsibility. Let me quote the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. They said last year, and I quote, we must form a circle of protection around the programs that serve the poor and the vulnerable in our nation and throughout the world. And as the Catholic leaders wrote last month, and again I quote, Congress should support access to adequate and nutritious food for those in need and oppose attempts to weaken or restructure these programs that would result in reduced benefits to hungry people. The House Farm Bill does the opposite. The cuts jeopardize the health and the well-being of America's families. It jeopardizes the growth and development of our children. It jeopardizes seniors and it puts at risk those disabled Americans. Uh, in my district, uh, yesterday, I went to the Cornerstone Christian Church in Milford, Connecticut. And the rep representatives there uh, were the woman who volunteers uh, in their food bank program, uh, Reverend Stackhouse of the Church of the Redeemer, uh, Lucy Nolan of End Hunger, Connecticut, Nancy Carrington, uh, who is the um, uh, Nancy, uh, who heads up the uh, Connecticut uh, Food Bank, and a young woman whose name was Penny. She had worked all of her adult life. She lost her job. She thought it was going to be easy to get another job and to be able to make her mortgage payments and all of the other financial obligations that she had. In the midst of this financial crisis, she and her husband separated, putting the burden of the family on her shoulders. She didn't know where to turn. She couldn't find, she didn't know how she was going to put food on the table. She went to the Connecticut Food Bank. They helped her to be able to access the uh, food stamp programs. And that's where she is now, still looking for a job, still wanting to work, still her pride enables her to continue to look for that job. The courage of speaking before this group yesterday and the press and to tell that stories of great courage like so many others are telling that stories, my colleagues tonight. We do have an obligation. These are not statistics that we're talking about. These are flesh and blood Americans who are looking for a bridge. They don't want to be there forever. They want to be able to take care of themselves and their families. It's the genius of the food stamp program was to say in times of need, we're there, and yes, we rise in the participation. When it gets better economically, those numbers drop. We have an obligation to those people, not to the statistics, but to those individuals who look to the federal government that says, in the time of challenge, give me a little help. That's all I'm asking. I don't want everything. I know you don't have all those resources. Help me in this hour of need. That's what our moral responsibility is. Again, I say thank you to my colleagues for participating, for your steadfastness in, uh, in dealing with this issue.
Let me uh, thank the gentlelady for that very um, powerful, uh, in many ways, very sad statement. We shouldn't have to listen to you say this in the wealthiest and most powerful country in the world. These stories shouldn't have, should not have to be told here, Congresswoman Delora. And so thank you also for reminding us, and I know that you're a person of tremendous faith, and there are many in this body who are believers, who have a faith, and uh, who care about the least of these. Mm -hmm. However, when we look at this $20 billion cut, you have to wonder where the the people of faith are and, and how they under, understand this mm -hmm. scripturally, I have to yeah. say. Yeah. And so thank you for raising this and go if for I it. If I can now. make one more point, mm -hmm. because in the committee, and that people shall be nameless, there was a lot of quoting of scripture when uh, people passed, voted for and passed a $12, $20 billion cut. And I think it was one individual who said that in the scripture it says if you don't work, then you don't eat. And I went back to find out what kinds of uh, subsidies from farm programs that the individual was, uh, has access to. And quite frankly, it's in the millions of dollars. And I'm delighted that this individual can take care of his family, but he's doing it with the largesse and the kindness, if you will, of the federal government. That doesn't seem to bother the individual at all. But providing food for a child or a senior or a disabled individual is a bridge too far. We need to stop that and we need to call attention to it and the people of this nation need to know what is happening in this institution. Absolutely and thank, and, and thank you for that. Uh, I just want to also uh, remind us tonight that, uh, well, first, I'm on the budget committee also. We had a debate about poverty, and we talked about, and both sides had something to say. Thank goodness at least we had a debate. But when it came to looking at the Ryan budget and the cuts that were enacted or that would be enacted if the Ryan budget passes, I can't for the life of me understand how anyone on the other side who wants to reduce poverty as they said they do, do could support the Ryan budget because it cuts every single government program which lifts people out of poverty right. into the middle class and will actually put more people into poverty if the Ryan budget cuts mm -hmm. are sustained. Mm -hmm. I, I know my colleague Mr. Johnson is here to speak. I think, and you understand this, but I think people need to know this. I want to take that crop insurance program for a moment. And I'm for crop insurance. I wish it covered people in my, in my uh, uh, community, in my state. Well, the comment is that the, the cost of the premiums in the, in the crop insurance program, 60% of those costs are picked up by the U.S. taxpayer. That doesn't include administrative costs. There is no income test, no wage thresholds. There is no asset test all of which apply to food stamp recipients. 26 individuals in this nation received at a minimum a million dollars in a premium subsidy and they don't even, they don't have to follow conservation programs, they don't have to do anything but accept that premium subsidy and we can't find out who they are because they are statutorily protected. You want to look, you want to look at a program where we can get money to deal with the deficit? Go there and not hurt poor kids, seniors, and the disabled. Those folks in that program getting at least a million dollars are eating high on the hog. They're doing well. And so that, that's what we have to do. That's what this country needs to know about. And we're a good country. People have good values, and they will turn their back on this effort as well. Thank you so much. Thank, for thank you again very much, and thank you for thank being you. with us tonight, making it very clear. Let me now uh, yield uh, a few minutes to my colleague from uh, Georgia, Congressman um, Hank Johnson, who has been a tremendous leader on so many issues, and he is now, and he'll talk about these bags that he brought here to the floor and the food stamp challenge, which many of us uh, have mounted, which I'll speak to uh, later. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm, I'm very happy to participate in this um, uh, special order, especially with the esteemed women that uh, are here, yourself, Barbara Lee, and Rosa DeLauro, 
a, a person of great uh, justice and passion and represents uh, truth and righteousness and tries to do the right thing and, um, and fights for those who uh, need a voice to fight for them. And I appreciate uh, you, Rosa, for being here and everything that you do. Uh, Barbara Lee, you know, I, I've said it before, uh, just a tremendous a patriot, uh, a, uh, a wonderful person, a heart of gold, uh, but a fist of uh, steel when it comes to what she believes in. And I deeply uh, respect and honor uh, both of those women. And today, I had the opportunity on the, uh, at the um, uh, Judiciary Committee uh, meeting where we were engaged in the war on women, uh, another abortion bill, and I, I, I happened to notice that on the other side of the aisle, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there were no women on the panel. And in fact, I discovered to my horror that there are no women on the Judiciary Committee, period. And uh, here we are in the year 2013. So uh, on this side of the aisle, we've got some great women like Rosa DeLauro, Barbara, uh, uh, Barbara Lee from California, and uh, so many others, Nancy Pelosi, uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, I can just name them for, for forever. And I just appreciate being able to serve with them. But I tell you, I'm not always out uh, doing a lot of shopping, but I had to go shopping today because I decided to take the, what we call the food stamp challenge. Uh, it mandates that we go out and we spend no more than $31.50 uh, for one week's worth of food. And so what I did, uh, I'm just coming back from the local Safeway. Maybe I shouldn't give that name out because I might have got a better deal at uh, Publix. I don't know, but I went to Gr uh, Safeway. And uh, here is my bill. It is for $29.76. And uh, so I went through the supermarket uh, trying to find a week's worth of food in um, uh, that uh, that can get me through and so you know y'all pardon me for my choice of uh, food but I had to go back to my standard uh, Quaker Oats uh, oatmeal trying to be healthy and I've got um, uh, so I can use this for, for breakfast or for dinner, but I've got these for breakfast, my uh, home-style waffles. They already have butter in them, so I didn't have to buy the butter. I did have to come up with, uh, with some uh, sugar-free, uh, of course, sugar-free syrup. Got that. I was pleased to find Oscar Mayer bacon on sale two for five dollars and uh, I think it was 99 cents so I got these two Oscar Mayer bacons I didn't mean to get the maple I meant to get the regular but anyway that was boom it was five dollars five six dollars I bought some milk and um, I did splurge on some tea I'm sorry I splurged on some tea but I did get some hot dogs and uh, topped it off with uh, some ramen, ramen noodles. I used to eat those a lot when I was in college too. So six of those in there, ten of these in here, and then uh, to splurge also uh, I bought some some bananas and uh, so that all ended up ended up costing um, twenty nine dollars and seventy six cents I actually had an overring because I bought two heads of uh, of broccoli 
we call those heads of broccoli, but two things of broccoli, I bought those, those ran me over. And so I had to go through the indignity of uh, standing there while the cashier called for an overring and they had to come over there and fix that and redo the whole thing and people in line behind me and everything and um, you know people trying to get in and out of the store they would have looked at me even more funny if I had uh, food stamps to make the purchase and they would wonder why was I eating Oscar Mayer bacon or we could you know I'm but this is what I'm going to be eating for the next seven days starting tomorrow. It's going to be a challenge. I certainly will not be eating three meals a day. I will eat in the morning and then I will eat in the evening. And so between this meat, these starches, that fruit, and this is a starch here with no greens. And I think they had greens at the, at the Safeway, but there are some places, they call them food deserts, uh, in the uh, central cities where there is no supermarket. So there are no fresh fruits, even if I had had the money to buy them. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, this is not the most healthiest of diets, but it will keep the hunger pangs away, I believe, for, for a week. Mm -hmm. And if I were a child living on this and going to school every day, I'm not sure how angry or depressed or how, how, how really ready to learn I would be. Uh, this is reality and so I'm looking forward to participating in this I understand you've done it now for uh, a number of years uh, Barbara and uh, this will be my first year and I can't say that I've been looking forward to it uh, but I have been getting ready for it mm -hmm. and um, so with that uh, I, I will you. yield back. Okay let me just first uh, thank the gentleman for um, that very powerful um, statement and also sharing with us what you were able to purchase and also uh, much of what you purchased has high sodium content as you said very few um, fresh fruit and vegetables uh, but what is, is just so tragic is that as members of Congress we don't live on this budget each and every day there's an end in sight for us but for millions of Americans there is no 